Lots of exciting news this month. So neutral atom quantum computers seem to be earning a top three place in the quantum race with these new results. Continuing with neutral atoms, two new papers show a way to convert errors into detectable errors known as erasures. Then we'll talk about the science behind the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year that led to one kind of quantum processor. And of course we have to talk about attosecond lasers, which earned the Nobel Prize in Physics this year. Hey everyone, welcome back to Quantum News Monthly, a show where we meet every month to talk about the latest and greatest in quantum information science. I'm your host, Debo. I'm your co-host, Mingyu. By the way, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what helped you and how we can improve. So please let us know in the comments. With that, let's jump straight into it, right? So neutral atoms have had a few really exciting developments recently. So let's start there. This study about high fidelity parallel entangling gates in neutral atoms just got published in Nature this month. And here's why it's significant. Scientists like ourselves have been working hard to build quantum computers because they can solve problems that everyday computers like these cannot realistically solve. And there are several different types of quantum computers under development. Up until recently, the front runners in the race for quantum computing has been superconducting qubits and trapped ions. Superconducting efforts have been led by companies like IBM and Google, while trapped ions have been adopted by companies like Quantinium and IonCube. Both platforms have shown really good control of their qubits as well as high fidelity operations. And by fidelity, I mean how accurately you can carry out operations on your qubits. Or in other words, how low are the error rates of your quantum gates. In the meantime, neutral atoms have been very useful in simulating quantum mechanical phenomena, aka quantum simulations. But when it came to quantum computing, the error rates were not low enough. Now for all quantum computers, the two qubit entangling operation is usually the most challenging in terms of suppressing errors. And for neutrals, the best two qubit gate fidelity was about 97 to 98% as of 2022. But this year, we have seen big improvements in this area. The group of scientists at Harvard and MIT demonstrated a fidelity of 99.5% per two qubit gate, which is great. This pushes neutral atoms to be among the front runners in the race now. But that's not all. They have also shown that neutral atoms have a power that is quite unique to their platform. And that is, in their processor, each atom is a qubit, and the atomic qubits are suspended in vacuum using tightly focused laser beams called optical tweezers. And these scientists can move these tweezers around to basically rearrange their qubits in any 2D arrangement that they want. And by bringing two atoms really close to each other, they can implement an entangling gate between those atoms. And the cool thing is that they can do this with many atom pairs at the same time. And that's how we get the high fidelity entangling gates in parallel. Good, now let's compare that with other platforms. So for superconductors, the qubits are fixed on the chip, so it's more costly to entangle qubits that are far away from each other. And for trapped ions, entangling far away qubits is not an issue, but the parallelization part is not as flexible, and it's an active area of work. So uh, we can say there's an interesting race going on. Yeah, for sure. But that's not the only news for neutral atom quantum computers this month, right? Yeah, a team of scientists from Princeton, Yale, and Strasbourg and also a team at Caltech demonstrated what's called erasure conversion. And let's see what this is about. Yeah, as we know, quantum computers are not perfect. They sometimes make errors. And reducing the error rate is very important for useful applications down the line. However, the error rate is not the only relevant factor here. The type of error is also important. Yeah, and erasure is a special type of error because when erasures occur, you know on which qubit erasures occurred. So, uh, let's say Alice wrote a message of zeros and ones and sent it to her friend Bob, but Eve got jealous and intercepted that message. And if Eve was very mean, she could flip some of the zeros to ones and ones to zeros. And this would be very confusing for Bob because he doesn't know which bits are correct and which are not. But instead, Eve got lazy, so she just erased some zeros and ones, leaving eraser marks. And that's better for Bob because he at least knows where the erasure happened by looking at the eraser marks. Quantum computing works the same way. If you can somehow convert physical errors into erasures, or in other words, if you can make your qubits to give you a signal whenever errors have occurred, it's good for quantum computing and simulation. 
for quantum error correction, you can use the information about where the, the location of erasures and correct them in a much easier way. And for quantum simulation, you can just throw away the result whenever erasure errors occurred so that you can take only the accurate results. For neutral atoms, this erasure conversion is done by using a special kind of atomic qubit, which is the metastable qubit. An atom has many electronic states, and people have typically used the two states with the lowest energy as two levels of a qubit. And that's natural choice because lower energy means more stable. However, there are also metastable states, which have higher energy, but are, but are also stable enough to be used as a qubit. And what's great about these metastable qubits is that most of the gate errors turn out to be your atom decaying to the lowest energy states. So your qubit is leaked outside, but fortunately, using additional lasers, you can detect whenever the atom falls into the lowest energy states. So now you have converted this leakage error into an erasure. And you can find whenever an error like this happens. So that's what the Princeton and Caltech experiments did. There are some interesting differences. The team led by Princeton used ytterbium atom and focused on analyzing the gate error rate. Caltech team used strontium atom and explored how much erasure conversion can improve the accuracy of quantum simulation experiments. Uh, you should check out the papers for more details. Moving on to the next exciting topic. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year was awarded to three scientists for the discovery and development of quantum dots. The awardees are Munji Bawendi, Louis Bruce, and Alexei Yakimov. Now you might remember that we talked about quantum dots last episode as the Delft team had developed a 2D array of semiconductor quantum dots for quantum computing. But this Nobel Prize is for a different kind of quantum dot, the original quantum dot. So let's start with the basics. A quantum dot is a semiconductor nanocrystal. So basically a semiconductor particle that's just a few nanometers in size. And that gives it some really interesting optical properties because of their size. That's because these nanoparticles tightly confine electrons, and so they exhibit quantum mechanical behavior similar to the particle in a box problem that you might be familiar with from your intro quantum course. If you're not familiar with it, all you need to know is that these nanoparticles will absorb and emit light of discrete energies, which is a quantum mechanical property. And the smaller the particles are, the higher the energy and the bluer the light that they emit. This is very unique compared to bigger particles because for most materials made of bigger particles that you see in everyday life, your color depends on what the atoms they're made up of and how the atoms are arranged, not the size of the particles that contain the atoms. And that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. The Nobel laureates discovered quantum dots in the 80s. So up until the 70s, Quantum theory was widely accepted, but very few practical applications were being thought of. Around this time, Yakimov was experimenting with colored glass that contained traces of copper chloride. He realized that the smaller the copper chloride crystals in the glass, the bluer the light that it absorbed. Now around the same time, Bruce was experimenting with nanoparticles of calcium sulfide in solution for a totally different research problem but he also discovered the same size-dependent optical behavior among his nanoparticles. Yakimov and Bruce published their findings in 1981 and 83 respectively. But it wasn't until 1993 that someone would find a reliable way of synthesizing high-quality quantum dots that were all the same consistent size. And that would be the third prize winner, Bowendi, who devised a carefully controlled chemical reaction to produce consistent high-quality quantum dots. If you would like to understand the process, feel free to pause on this illustration here. Since then, quantum dots have found widespread commercial applications, including TVs, where they are used to produce more vibrant colors, to lamps, where they alter the warmth of the emitted light, and even in places like biochemistry and medicine. Going back to the quantum dots that we talked about last week, those are also similar in principle, because there too, the electrons are tightly confined at certain sites, and the electrons are what are used as qubits. But instead of nanoparticles, they use semiconductor-based chips, and the sites are defined by voltages that are applied by wires rather than the physical boundary of a nanoparticle. Because they follow the same principles, 
these lithographically fabricated devices are also called quantum dots. So in some way, this chemistry Nobel Prize winning science has an important connection to quantum information science as well. Now let's go to the Nobel Prize in Physics, which was given to Pierre Agostini, Ferenc Cross, and Anne Lulier for generating all the second laser pulses for studying moving electrons. So what's an attosecond? Attosecond is one billionth of a billionth of a second. That's 10 to the minus 18 second. It's so short that there are more attoseconds in a second than there are seconds in the entire history of the universe. Wow. Yeah, it's very short. So if you can create light pulses that short, you can study phenomena that occur that fast, such as tracking the oscillations of the electrons inside molecules. And this, of course, has been much harder than tracking the oscillations of atoms inside molecules, as electrons are much lighter and faster than atoms. In 1987, Anne Lulier and colleagues performed an experiment of transmitting a laser beam through a gas of argon atoms. Argon is a noble gas, which means that it doesn't react easily. However, what the scientists saw was very interesting. What they measured, when they measured the spectrum of the light that came out of the argon gas, they saw many peaks at multiples of the laser frequency. And later, theoretical works found out that this was due to the electron's motion in the atom. The laser has an electric field, which oscillates over time. At one moment, the field helps the electron almost get kicked out of the atom. However, at the next moment, the field brings the electron back to orbit. And when the electron is brought back to orbit, the kinetic energy of the electron gets converted to light. And uh, you have many peaks, frequency peaks, because the frequency depends on how far the electron moved during this process. Then what happens when all these lights with different harmonic frequencies combine? As you can see from this picture, when waves superimpose in the right way, we get the other second pulses. And you can watch the video from 60 symbols for a really nice explanation of how this works. Uh, so Pierre Agostini and his group generated such a train of pulses and measured the length of each pulse in 2001 which turns out to be only 250 attoseconds per pulse. And what's more, Ferenc Cross and his group in the same year showed that they could actually pick a single pulse from the train of pulses and switch the single pulse to another track, which can be used for experiments of studying the movement of electrons. So on the longest extreme, 10 to the 17 second is the history of the universe, which is the time scale explored by cosmology. And on the shortest extreme, Thanks to these attosecond laser pulses, we can probe phenomena in the 10 to the minus 17 second regime. So the current state of physics altogether can cover a staggering 34 orders of magnitude. And I think this is amazing. Attosecond laser pulses seem to be a great example of work of scientists trying so hard to expand the reach of human knowledge. Yeah, wow, that really is amazing. Thank you for tuning in this month for all these amazing science announcements. Uh, make sure to subscribe and we'll see you next month.